Hey guys, uh, thank you for joining me in another IGCSE Biology Revision video. Today we're going to be continuing on with the Common Errors and Misconceptions series where we go through common exam errors that have been made in the past by students so that we can avoid you making the same mistakes in your own exam. So here we're going to be going through five MCQ questions and you should, as I scroll through the five questions, you should pause the video and actually solve the questions first and you should be able to solve these five questions in three minutes and 45 seconds. So I'm going to scroll through now, make sure you arrive at an answer first. Okay, so I hope you have all derived the answers and we'll just go through this first question here, which are effectors and the answer here was B, which are the muscles and glands. Unfortunately, a lot of people got this wrong by stating A, which is the brain and spinal cord, which we know is part of the CNS. And so this really just tests your understanding of how the nervous system generally works. And remember, we've got these receptors that are, uh, that, that are they're sensitive to certain stimuli. That could be light, temperature, sound, you name it. So when the receptors uh, when, when the stimulus has the receptors, then the receptors are going to respond by sending impulses to the CNS, uh, or, or mainly the brain. And the impulses from the receptors to the brain get carried through the sensory neurons. Right? And the brain is going to interpret that information and send impulses to the effectors and the impulses travel through the motor neurons. And so the effectors are again muscles or glands that are going to respond to the impulses that come to it from the brain via the motor neurons and carry out a certain response. Okay, And so this is an example of a voluntary action where the brain actually coordinates the response and you know we sort of consciously decide on what to do. But there is something called an involuntary response and that may be carried out by a reflex arc where you don't get the impulses from the receptors going to the brain. Instead, you get a direct link to the motor neurons by what we call the relay neurons. And so because the brain doesn't need to carry out any sort of decision making process, the response to that particular stimuli that comes from the receptors will be much, much quicker. And so this general pathway is something that you really need to be aware of, but here in this question, again, the answer was B. So which mechanism for maintaining body temperature involves the action of muscles? The answer was C, because as we shiver, the muscles are respiring, and under really cold circumstances, because the muscles are respiring, they will produce heat and that heat is going to warm us up. And uh, a lot of people actually incorrectly decided to go for option D, which was sweating. And uh, sweating is indeed a way for us to maintain body temperature. Uh, when we're really hot, the sweat glands are going to produce sweat that are going to sort of leak onto the skin. And the sweat is then going to evaporate from the skin, allowing the skin to cool down. But unfortunately, the sweat gland is not a muscle. and the answer here was wrong because the key word here was what involves the action of muscles. So this third question was challenging apparently and not many people got this correct. The graph shows the number of people infected with HIV in one part of the world between 1985 and 2010. So they asked using the graph which statement is correct and here the answer was A. And so this question was just testing your knowledge about how to calculate a percentage increase. So from 1995, which is over here, the number of people that had HIV was 12 million. Whereas in 2000, if you take a look, the number of people infected was 20 million. So it went from 12 to 20, so that's an 8 million increase. Now 8 million divided by the original 12 million times by 100 is going to give you 67% increase. Okay, So that's why the answer was A. Now before I move on to this fourth question, I just want to quickly 
take a look at uh, my A-Star Masterclass channel. And so, if I just load that up here, I've recently added a lot of different things to this channel, and I think some of which you will find very helpful. So, for example, I've got this IGCSE Biology exam training course for paper 4 where I basically just go through some common types of questions that they've asked on a topic by topic basis. This is going to allow you to sort of understand what sort of questions you might get asked in your particular examinations for each particular topic in the course and if so how to answer them as well. So I go through all of that and I've got over 100 exclusive videos on here that you can take a look at so make sure you go and check that out if you are interested. So moving on to this fourth question which type of cell is produced by meiosis and surprisingly a lot of people got this wrong. The answer here was D because the whole point of meiosis is to create haploid cells or gametes. And so diploid cells, remember, have pairs of chromosomes. In the human body, the original number is 46 because you've got 23 pairs of chromosomes. But meiosis is the sort of type, uh, the, the cell division that will establish haploid cells from diploid cells. So the diploid cells will divide to form cells that are haploid which means they only have half the original chromosome number, 23. And this is really important because remember, uh, the, the gametes will always fuse together to form a zygote. For example, the sperm cell will fuse with the egg cell in sexual reproduction. So when that happens, you need the zygote, which is the, which is the cell that forms after you fuse, to have the original number of 46 chromosomes. That's why 23 plus 23 will give you 46. And if you didn't have that halving of the chromosome number when you form the gametes, imagine having 46 chromosomes in the sperm cell and 46 chromosomes in the egg cells. That means you'll end up with 92 chromosomes and every generation you're going to get a doubling of the chromosome number which is going to really screw things up and so that's not what we want and therefore meiosis here is going to prevent that from happening. So. This last question, what will cause the rate of mutation to increase? And a lot of people weren't aware that an increase in exposure to ionizing radiation increases the chance of mutation. Remember, mutation is simply the change in DNA base sequence. Whatever it is, it causes some sort of change in the DNA for the better or worse. And so because there's a change in the DNA, it can introduce genetic variation in the population. So in fact, a lot of people went for answer B. But the problem is, although the although mutation can increase genetic variation, the opposite is not true. An increase in genetic variation is not going to lead to more mutation. So this was a fairly tricky one and caught a lot of people off guard. But regardless, yes, ionizing radiation is dangerous because it can cause mutations and generally mutations can uh, sort of alter the DNA in a bad way and cause a lot of harm. But sometimes the mutation can be good as well. Um, but here the answer was A. So I hope you find that uh, helpful guys. I've uploaded some free notes and uh, for, for this particular video and you can find it on the, the link that I've uh, put up here above. Uh, but otherwise I will see you in the next video.